I'm Tim Ventura, and in this presentation, Dr. Daniel Sheehan will discuss the limitations of the second law of thermodynamics and new research that defies standard thinking about heat engines and may offer a path to a new kind of energy generation. Dr. Sheehan is a professor of physics at the University of San Diego and has explored experimentally testable challenges to the second law of thermodynamics for over 25 years. In 2002, he organized the first international conference on the limits of the second law, and in 2005, co-authored the first mainstream treatise on the subject. His other interests include retrocausation, nanotechnology, planetary formation, and plasma physics. All right, Thank what I'd like to do is um, actually kind of go to a talk uh, from a couple of years ago at, a, at one of the Starship conferences. As most of you are, probably all of you are aware, uh, about 10 years ago, DARPA and NASA put together the 100-year Starship um, uh, conference out in Orlando. And I was invited to that by um, Chris McKay at NASA Ames because uh, we knew each other and he was aware of some of the work I was doing associated with thermodynamics. And it turns out that some of these ideas probably pertain certainly to any kind of interstellar uh, travel, but also um, as kind of a case study in, in uh, science, which is uh, many people consider heretic heretical, but at the same time um, has good um, uh, standing at this point. So um, what I'd like to do is you know, talk about two kinds of starships, um, one which people normally envision and one which we live on and then talk about the energy requirements for emission, at least in kind of broad sense. And then discuss thermal energy, which is, um, uh, which is something that uh, most people kind of take for granted, but in fact uh, is probably the primary energy source on, on Earth, um, at least that might be accessible. And then talk about the second law, which of course has a, a great mystique around it, which actually forbids many scientists from actually discussing it in a serious way. Then I'd like to discuss uh, heat recyclers, which are devices which take heat and uh, should be able to turn it back into work, and discuss a couple of examples from work done here at the University of San Diego. We've investigated um, the teams here, roughly about a dozen different types, uh, most theoretical, and actually not most, um, most started theoretical, and some have actually been um, demonstrated or have substantiation in the laboratory. Finally, some applications and some conclusions. So first of all, um, if you look at a, the standard conception of a starship, um, if you look at the time in years uh, that it takes to travel to a, a distance um, in light years, uh, you just divide by uh, velocity divided by the speed of light, the beta number from special relativity, and that'll tell you how long it'll take to go. Uh, traveling at the speed of light for, 10, uh, for a distance of 10 light years, of course, is 10 years. But if you're only going at a, a tenth the speed of light, it'll take you 100 years. The second starship is the one we live on, and it's been around for four and a half billion years and will be around for uh, probably at least that amount of time one way or the other, whether we're with it or not is another matter until the sun goes into the red giant phase and subsumes the earth. Now, the necessities for a starship, uh, if you wanted to boil it down to three things, you certainly need matter to get there. Uh, you need energy to propel it. And of course, there's no point in going if there's no humanity behind it. What I'll be discussing is simply the energy aspect. Now, this first type of starship, well, there are two kinds of energy you'd want to consider. One is propulsion. Another one is operation and life support. Okay. Again, these are rather broad categories. Now, for, propul for propulsion, let's say you're aiming for a velocity of about a tenth the speed of light. And let's say your spacecraft is maybe a small generational one, a, a thousand tons, which would be kind of on maybe on the light side, I don't know. 10 to the six kilograms, kinetic energy at 10th speed of light, five, 10 to the 20th joules, which is roughly the energy uh, used um, by civilization over a year's period. So um, to get up a small object to, the, to a, even a 10th speed of light would be prohibitive, at least currently. And this, and this assumes no inefficiencies in your, in your propulsion. Now, life support, um, air, air, food, water, electricity, heating, cooling, recycling, what have you. Um, you assume, let's say, one kilowatt per person for all of these on a steady basis. That would be uh, three 10 to the 10th joules per person per year. Um, so uh, roughly uh, 1,000 kilograms of chemical fuel per person per year. 
And if you want to have a distance of 10 light years at a 10th speed of light, that would take 100 years. For a 100 person crew, that'd be 10 to the fifth kilograms per person in chemical fuel, 10 to the seventh kilograms uh, for the crew. Um, and the kinetic energy um, associated with bringing that up to the, this, to the speed of light, um, uh, 10 times the world's energy use for a year. So again, prohibitive. Again, no inefficiencies are assumed here. Um, so chemical fuels are probably not going to get you where you want to go. Alternatives. Well, if you look at um, uh, some quantity E, change in energy over mc squared for fission, the uh, efficiency there, so to speak, is uh, 10 to the minus 3, one, ten, one thousandth of a mass of a large nucleus when it uh, fissions turns into energy. For fusion, you might do better, maybe one hundredth, one percent. Matter, antimatter, well, you could claim that's one, but um, if you actually want to produce the antimatter, that's not very efficient by modern means. Um, let's say if you're using gamma rays to uh, illuminate a metal to create electron positron pairs and then separate them, or if you want to use lasers on a metal to create electron positron pairs, the efficiency is quite low, 10 to the minus six. And of course, if you're using anything like fission fusion, matter, matter antimatter kinds of reactors, you'd have good deal of radiation to deal with, shielding, infrastructure, and so on. Now I'd like to shift gears and look at something which is really prosaic and something most people don't even consider, which is just thermal energy. If you look at an air molecule, the root mean square velocity of an air molecule is about 500 meters a second, which is really about twice the velocity of a typical jet airplane. So in this room or in the room you're sitting in right now, the air molecules, oxygen, nitrogen, argon, water, whatever else, are bouncing off of you at uh, you know, twice the speed of a jet plane, but since they're all bouncing pretty much evenly across both sides of your body in all directions, the pressure is uniform, there's no problem. But if you look at it in terms of pure energy, in terms of kinetic energy only, not rest mass energy, but just thermal energy, in one cubic meter of air, the kinetic energy is roughly 150 kilojoules, which is equivalent to the explosive yield of 35 grams of TNT. And, um, and that's, uh, that's not just for air, that's for everything. Anything with a temperature above absolute zero has thermal energy. And so the air in the room you're in, probably right now is a typical office room, probably has the energy associated with, you know, something like a half a box of, of dynamite, something like that. Um, a glass of water has the equivalent energy of about 50 grams of TNT when you look at all of its energy associated with thermal energy, latent heat of, um, of fusion, and so on. If you were to look at the Earth's atmosphere, ocean, and upper crust, the total thermal energy um, of that is roughly 10,000 times the entire energy associated with known fossil fuel reserves, virtually unlimited amounts of energy. And so thermal energy is clearly ubiquitous in any environment above absolute zero. It's plentiful, and it has a relatively high energy density. So is it ideal? Well, you may think so, but there's a sticking point which most people point to, which is known as the second law of thermodynamics. Now, if the second law could be bent or broken, then thermal energy would in fact become probably the most ubiquitous, plentiful, high energy density recyclable and inexhaustible energy source available around. Now, there are four laws of thermodynamics. There are the zero, first, second, and third. The um, zeroth and third, well, they're pretty much, how should I put it, definitional. Uh, they are not, uh, they are, well, the zeroth law was invented last. After they had the first, second, and third law, they realized they had forgotten the law, and so they backed up and put in the zeroth. If they find another one, they'll call it the negative first, I assume, but who knows. Um, the uh, zeroth law simply has to do with temperature and equilibrium, basically saying that thermometers exist, not, not too profound. The third um, of, talks about fiduciary entropies. Uh, third law, in fact, can be claimed to have been broken by a number of different kinds of things like uh, superconducting currents and so on. And one of my friends, Marlon Scully, once said that the third law has all the weight of an Italian traffic advisory. It's the first and second law, which are the heart and soul, the meat and bones of the flesh and blood of, of thermodynamics. And um, these two laws are rather simple. I mean, first law is conservation of energy. 
And the second is that the entropy of the universe never decreases and tends to increase. Now, there are lots of different ways of stating the second law. We'll talk about that in a moment. Excuse me, going back up. And, but let's look at the first law, just as, as kind of a, um, how should I put it? A case of, of how laws actually develop. In 1800, the um, law of conservation of energy would apply to kinetic and potential energies, basically things you would find in a standard Lagrangian. Um, gravitational potential energy, um, a rotational kinetic energy, and so on. In 1850, um, it was discovered that heat is a form of energy. And so that was thrown into the pot to keep conservation of energy intact. 1905, you have rest mass energy. 1940, roughly, you have zero point energy. 1970, false vacuum energy. 1998, dark energy. Every time you find a way, a new form of energy that might break this law, you simply throw it into the pot and suddenly the conservation of energy holds true again. The first law, in fact, is not really a law in the sense that it is not contingent. It is not something that you can find an exception to. You can always redefine energy such as to keep the first law true, which is rather remarkable for a law, one that cannot be violated because in a sense, it's simply an accounting system. If you ever find something that looks like it violates it, Simply throw in that new kind of energy and everything's fine. The second law is different though. This is, what, this is a law that tells you what you can't do. And this law is one that in principle is violable. And there are lots of ways of stating it. Heat flows from hot to cold, masses expand to fill the space available in general. The only way to deal with a can of worms is to find a bigger can. You have Murphy's laws and corollaries. If anything can go wrong, it will. Situations tend to progress from bad to worse. Perpetual motion machines are impossible. Now, this is a nice one because this one has a ring of shame to it, which is probably one of the principal ways in which you and I and other people who, who think, uh, work with ideas which are unpopular are held in place. And of course you have, we're all going to die. And that's probably the ultimate statement of the second law. But there are formal and technical forms of the second law which are worth looking at. Uh, my favorite and often considered the gold standard of second laws was developed in 1850 um, by Kelvin, also known as the Kelvin-Planck law, when it was uh, finally uh, put in place. No device operating in a cycle can produce the sole effect of extraction of a quantity of heat from a heat reservoir in the performance of an equal quantity of work. In other words, you can turn some heat into work, like in a heat engine, but you can't turn it all into work. You only can turn a fraction of it, in, and the best you can do for a heat engine would be the Carnot efficiency. Entropy of the universe is always, for any entropy change in the universe or any natural process will always be greater than or equal to zero. And that means entropy changes for the universe or for a closed system less than zero are not possible. Perfectly efficient heat engines, heat engines are impossible and by extension, perfectly um, efficient refrigerators are also impossible. And then, of course, perpetual or perpetuum mobile of the second type are impossible. Uh, when Vlada Kapek and I wrote um, uh, the only text, apparently, in the scientific literature on challenges to the second law back in 2005, we collected 21 different formula formulations of the second law and 21 different formulations of entropy. Uh, entropy is also a malleable quantity. Um, the uh, scientific uh, historian in WAG, uh, Clifford Truesdale, once said, um, every physicist knows what the first and second law are. The only, the only problem is, is no two physicists have the same definitions. And you'll often find that to be the case when you speak to physicists and chemists about the second law, they have their own favorite version of it. Um, and, and they ultimately all point in the same direction, but in subtle ways, they are different. But among the, in the second law, the second law is probably unique, uh, maybe not unique, but certainly maybe at the top of the pile in terms of having a mystique. This is a kind of a, an imaginary shield around it, which makes it uh, very difficult to discuss it in a rational way with scientists. And this mystique springs from uh, imprimaturs put on the second law by various renowned scientists over the years, from Einstein to Arthur Eddington, Enrico Fermi, and many others, who say things about the second law which, which make it so intimidating that people are afraid to approach it. And as a result, well, there's no progress. 
Um, the law of that entropy always increases. The second law of thermodynamics holds, I think, the supreme position among the laws of nature. Well, and then it goes on to say, if, you're, if your theory goes against the second law, I can, I can give you no hope. There's nothing but to collapse in deepest humiliation. This old chestnut is trotted out on a regular basis to try to keep people, I think, uh, bucked up to believe the second law is still in great shape and uh, will go on forever. The history of the second law um, uh, up to about 30 years ago might have borne that out, but not really anymore. History of the second law, you can trace back almost 200 years now to uh, Saadi Carnot in um, looking at the heat efficiencies, uh, the efficiencies of heat engines. Uh, it really got on the map about 1850 when uh, theoretical physicists started coming into play. <clears throat> Rudolf Clausius made the, maybe the form, first formal statement of the second law, Lord Kelvin. Um, uh, then Rudolf Clausius again, defining entropy, 1867, the famous Maxwell Demon thought experiment which in fact is, was a straw man when it started and has remained a straw man for the last 150 years, and yet continues to attract attention largely as a whipping boy. 1872, uh, Ludwig Boltzmann with the famous H theorem, which of course uh, is a theorem which is based on a faulty assumption, the Stoschel Ansatz. Uh, 1890, Willard Gibbs, foundation of statistical mechanics, Max Planck, beginning of quantum mechanics, which actually arose from considerations of thermodynamics. 1910, pretty much all the major statements of the second law had been stated by then. It's been over 100 years now, and not much new has been said about statements of the second law. If there were to be a, um, a, a new 21st century formulation, it should be something like this, in my opinion. For any spontaneous process in the universe, the entropy never decreases, except when it does. Now, when it comes to second law challenges, we're in a golden age right now. Since 1995, uh, roughly about, uh, what, um, 25 years ago, there have been three, actually closer to four dozen challenges entered into the refereed scientific literature. More than 80 articles have been uh, published, maybe closer to 100 now, I'm not sure. There have been four international conferences. These have been held at the University of San Diego starting in 2002 and with uh, conference proceedings from the American Institute of Physics. The technical monograph I referred to earlier with by Capek and me, and really an untold number of patents, uh, probably in the US and world uh, patent literature. It's really unclear to me how many patents actually deal with the second law. These are crypto patents in a way. These are ones which actually deal with second law violators, but have, are not phrased in that sense because uh, they probably wouldn't have gotten through the patent offices otherwise. I know of at least a couple. Now, what does it mean to violate the second law? Well, in the Kelvin Planck sense, this would correspond to what is called a heat recycler. So you would have some thermodynamic system right here, which uh, does some work for you and then has some waste heat as a result. That waste heat goes to the heat recycler, that re 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 heat recycler turns that heat back into work, which goes back into the system. And in principle then, you should be able to create a feedback system, a system enclosed both the system and the heat recycler in which Useful things get done in the system, which generate waste heat, and that waste heat gets recycled by the heat recycler back into work to keep the system running. This is why it would be called why it would be it would be called a perpetual motion machine. So, would these such would such things be possible? Well, we've investigated a number of them at the University of San Diego over the last uh, three decades or more, and I'm only going to talk about a couple of them ones that uh, are currently under study, some of the ones that have been finished, have been put, put aside. Um, but this is a general idea which um, uh, uh, pertains to a number of them, which comes up, which, which is um, born upon the idea of what is called epicatalysis. And this is what is called an epicatalytic thermal diode. Epicatalytic refers to the type of catalysis that, is, that undergoes um, and diode because it has a, um, a one-way direction for heat. So an epicatalytic thermal diode would work in, a, in the following way. Imagine that you have a molecule, A2, so it's a diatomic. Let's say it's a, a homonuclear, something like oxygen, nitrogen, or hydrogen, something with the same a molecule, same atom making up the molecule, which can disassociate into, um, into two atoms. And this would occur on surface one. 
Now, this molecule forms its, is formed as a molecule because that's a more stable energetic position, uh, configuration of the two atoms. So if you break it into two, in, into two atoms, you have to supply energy there, which means that this surface will give up thermal energy into this, mo into this molecule to break it up. Those two, those two atoms then come to surface number two. This would be a different material. And that material, instead of disassociating at molecules, tends to recombine atoms. So um, these two atoms would then recombine to form, an, to form a molecule, A sub two. And then these could cycle back to surface one. Now notice what happens here. Surface one provides um, heat energy to break the molecule into atoms. Therefore, it cools and is at temperature one. Meanwhile, surface two, because it is getting the energy of recombination from atoms into molecules, gets energy from these, these atoms forming the molecule and therefore heats up, temperature two. So now you have, you have created what appears to be a spontaneous temperature differential, temperature one and temperature two. Once you have that, you have the makings of a heat engine. That temperature two can, can be, heat from the temp temperature two can be flowed through a heat engine with regular Carnot or less efficiency back into temperature one, um, heat bath, and work comes out. So this thermal diode then um, would, in principle, violate the second law. It has turned basically heat into work. If you were to put a box around this thing, work would come out of it until the whole system cools down to the point where it would no longer work. On the other hand, if you continually feed heat into surface one, this thing should run forever. In fact, this concept was tested. Um, there were a number of uh, theoretical papers uh, supporting the idea going back to Physical Review uh, E uh, back in 1998, um, and also a more uh, uh, a further one, which coins the term uh, epicatalysis in Physical Review E in 2013, uh, Journal of Non-Equilibrium Thermodynamics, and then some modeling done for sustainable energy technology assessments. And so we've talked about the theory where you have molecules which break up on two different surfaces and cycle between the two, creating a temperature differential, a steady state temperature differential between two materials. Now to give you an idea of what that would, be, that would correspond to in everyday life, imagine that you had a cup of coffee sitting on your desk, which, which um, stays hot forever and is being fed energy by an ice cube nearby you would expect the ice cube, cube to heat up, melt, and form a pool of water. You'd expect the, the coffee to stay, to cool off as well, and the, everything should come to thermal equilibrium of your room. But if you created a situation where something in your room stayed hot forever or cold forever, or if the two interplayed with each other, such that they had a temperature differential between them and never came to thermal equilibrium, that is a classic, classic def, um, example of a second law violation, which you never see in everyday life but you can create this situation in the laboratory. So here's an experiment that, was, that had its roots back in the year about 2000, and the, the definitive experiments were done um, in 2013, published in Foundations of Physics in 2014. Follow-up experiments uh, I'll talk about later, uh, US patent associated with this uh, listed down at the bottom. So here's the basic experiment. You have a vacuum system, high vacuum down to about 10 to the minus six tor, at least when you start. Um, and you have a black body cavity. This black body cavity is enlarged over here. And the black body cavity can, has current passing through the outer envelope of the cavity, such that it heats up ohmically to a temperature of anywhere from room temperature up to about 2000 degrees. Pressure inside the cavity, uh, is typically uh, 10 to the minus six when it's uh, not being operated and up to about uh, uh, a thousand to a hundredth of a tor when, when fully operating. So here's, here's what happens. This is a black body cavity right here. And you would expect two thermocouples on the inside to have the same temperature. And they do under normal circumstances. The walls of the cavity are made out of tungsten. The thermal couple is covered with, a, with a, about a micron thick of tungsten also, and a third, second thermocouple has rhenium coated on the outside. Now, the walls of the cavity can be made out of either tungsten or rhenium. 
um, I'm going to give you the tungsten case, but the rhenium case was also done with comparable results. So here's what happens. If you heat up this black body cavity, pass current through the walls and heat the whole thing up to 2000 degrees or any temperature below that, let's say, both of these thermocouples read the same temperature when you're in pure vacuum. This is exactly what you'd expect. It's basically the thermocouples are thermalizing inside this black body cavity. No big deal. Now you put in helium. Helium is an inert gas. And again, the thermocouples come to the same temperature as the cavity walls. That's not surprising either because, well, helium is an inert gas. There are no chemical reactions associated with it normally. But now, if you put hydrogen gas, when hydrogen gas was introduced into this cavity at the same pressures with the same temperature walls, the temperatures of these two materials were vastly different. For, for pressures on around from a tenth of a tor up to about 10 tor or so, the, the effect was most pronounced. And it was found that the rhenium cooled with respect to the tungsten by over 120 degrees and stayed there. In other words, here is a black body cavity in which your two materials come to different temperatures, large temperature differentials, over 100 degrees Kelvin, and stay there indefinitely. This is a formal violation of the second law of thermodynamics. A second idea, um, another idea associated with um, uh, breaking the second law, plays with the statistics of, of thermodynamics. Most of you are probably aware that of something called the Boltzmann exponential. That's e to the power minus energy divided by kT, which is the energy of a, of a molecular or atomic state divided by the thermal energy. And if you wanted to look at the um, relative populations of, let's say, two energy levels in a, um, in, a, in a thermodynamic system, the way you would express it normally is to say, well, the difference in population or the ratio of populations of the higher state to the lower state is simply e to the minus delta e between the two states divided by the thermal energy, Boltzmann constants times the absolute temperature. This is standard fare, the, you know, basically the foundations of statistical mechanics. But there's another term associated with these two states, which are usually overlooked. And this is known as the, degen the degeneracy factor. It's not only what determines the pop relative populations of these two states, it's not simply the energy difference between them, but it's the number of states that are at each energy level. You may have two down here, you may have five up here, but it turns out that that affects the population statistics. That folds in as well. So it turns out, coming to this, to this diagram, if you had, a, if you had a, a physical system in which your energy states were in such a way that you have a ground state with, 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 with let's say just one in the population, one state there, second one would have two or four, eight, 16, 32, 64, and so on. If the degeneracy of, that, of these states increases sufficiently rapidly, then it becomes favorable for a particle at the lowest state to wander up and make thermal jumps up to the highest energy state available if the super degeneracy criterion is met, such that it, can, that it can get not just a thermal energy jump when it's all done, but many thermal energy jumps at once if it were, were, to, if it were to fall down by this route. This, this, this drop from here could be 10 kT, which would be what's called super thermal or energy enough to do work. This principle of super degeneracy uh, was worked out by Larry Schulman and I uh, uh, and published back in uh, 2019, and we've done some uh, other work on it since then. So how might this work? Let's consider something like a super degenerate thermal photo photovoltaic. Now, all of you are probably familiar with how a regular photovoltaic works. Here we have a p-dope semiconductor over here. And over here, we have an n-dope semiconductor. Between an n-dope and p-dope semiconductor in a diode, you have what's called a depletion region, where you have an electric field and a potential drop called the built-in potential. The way, the way normal um, photovoltaics work is the following. A photon, given by this red swiggly line, comes into the semiconductor and ejects a photon from the valence band of the semiconductor up 
into the conduction band. That electron then can wander around, but when it reaches the region over here <clears throat> of the depletion region, the electric field here sweeps it into the end region. And so you have electrons building up over here on this side of your semiconductor. And on the other side where your hole has been created over here, that ends up being a positive charge. And as a result, you have a positive and negative charge. Um, and from that, you create electricity through a load. And everyone's happy about this. This is called a regular photovoltaic. It uses a high energy photon with energy uh, greater than the band gap energy in order to work. This has no violation of the second law associated with it whatsoever. But if you were to build a number of what's called a super degenerate ladder in the band gap here by putting in dopants of correct type and quantity, such as to create a super degeneracy ladder where the number of possible states at each level is greater than the previous one, satisfying the super degeneracy condition. In principle, in principle then, purely thermal photons could go, could go from the valence band hopping by thermal energy jumps up through the conduction band, up through the um, forbidden band, up into the conduction band, and then act like a regular electron and a regular hole, and you would have been using thermal energy to do it. This is a super degenerate thermal photovoltaic. This is a theoretical construct right now. Um, we are st uh, still working on the experiments associated with it, but this itself would be a, basically a photovoltaic that roops, works at room temperature or anywhere else around room temperature without any light available except regular infrared associated with the environment. If you got electricity out of this system, this would be a violation of the second law as well. So um, <clears throat> what could you do with heat recyclers? Well, pretty much anything you could do with anything else that produces work, heating, cooling, refrigeration, electricity, um, the power densities associated with some of these are actually quite large for things like the epicatalytic thermodiode, the power densities per, per square per unit area are something on the order of 10 to the fifth watts per square meter um, or higher, they can be quite large. And um, if you were to have a closed environment like a starship, you could recycle your energy around, not simply making it reusable, but really recyclable. And so uh, thermal energy, if it becomes recyclable, with good thermal insulation, it is essentially uh, you've created a nearly inexhaustible energy supply. So what does this mean for the second Starship Earth? Well, this is what keeps many of us in the game here. Um, energy makes the world go round. That's, that's pretty clear. Energy is the currency of change. Nothing changes in the world or in nature whatsoever without an energy exchange of some sort. In the human, humanistic sense, the energy making the world go round doesn't just mean the rotation of the Earth or the orbiting of the Earth around the sun. Uh, energy makes the world go round chemically, thermodynamically, economically, politically, geopolitically, militarily. We do virtually everything for energy's sake. Worldwide use is roughly um, 18, power use is roughly 18 terawatts. And energy itself and the energy and the industry around it probably corresponds to probably 10 to 20% of the world's economy, depending on how you count it. Of course, there are finite supplies of, um, of most of the energies we're interested in um, that aren't renewables. Oil, maybe we may have 40 years left, gas 70, coal 250. Um, and if we use it all, we'll burn the planet down. Consequences, of course, are obvious. Climate, environmental change, pollution, global warming, Ecosystem destruction, for me, the, the worst consequence is the anthrop Anthropocene mass extinction that we're currently um, uh, overseeing. I think that's uh, it's, it's the greatest sin of humanity at the current time. Insufficient supplies, of course, lead to economic instability, shortages, famines, social unrest, and military interventions, as, as the United States has seen over the last uh, many years. So to um, summarize, heat recyclers, um, you have would be useful both in Starship Type One and Starship Type Two, and our uh, world has plenty of energy in it. There's ten thousand times more of it just lying around than all the fossil fuel reserves. But if energy is recyclable, you'd never actually go through it, even if you tried. You just simply just keep going around and around and around with the same stuff. So, challenges of interstellar travel, time, space, and energy are the challenges. 
Heat recyclers offer mitigation to the energy issue. Um, now, starships are a collection of impossible technologies, whether you have photon rockets or Alcubierre drives, wormholes, cryopreservation, whatever. Um, there are, it's just a collection of impossible technologies. And I decided to put together what I would consider my own um, logarithmic scale of difficulties. Uh, so this is a difficulty scale. And at the top, I think uh, for humanity, I think an interstellar mission is probably just about at the top of the top of the difficulty scale. So APEC is uh, um, is considering things which are certainly uh, near the top or at the top. Um, interstellar propulsion systems, um, of course, I would put right up near the top as well. Controlled nuclear fusion. Earlier in my career, I was a plasma physicist, and um, controlled nuclear fusion. I would certainly say uh, something with a Q greater than one. Uh, certainly, one that's and one that is, let's say, commercial is uh, tremendously difficult and probably will not be seen, well, will not be seen in our lifetime, uh, at least if we go along the route of the tokamak. Apollo moon mission I'd put up near the top. Um, Earth's orbit, uh, breaking the sound barrier was pretty tough. Breaking the second law is really not that hard. It just takes a little bit of imagination and the ability to go against the grain. Wright Brothers airplane, tough. Hang gliding is not so bad. Flying a kite's fun, crashing a plane is trivial. But on this difficulty scale, uh, I put one above all the rest, and that's getting human, human beings to believe something that they don't want to believe. And I think that's something all of you in the audience probably have faced one time or another, and certainly um, uh, I have as well. And this is um, something we all have to contend with. So, summary. There are second law devices now, which are coming to the fore. The stuff that I, the ones that I have discussed are, are merely a, probably a few of roughly a half a dozen, which now have a good deal of experimental support and still trying to come out of the noise in the scientific community. Uh, but the implications of it, I think, uh, for starships and maybe for powering starships in the sense of making more efficient, uh, let's say, positron production and so on, could be uh, quite sizable. For the Earth itself, uh, something must be done. The current uh, trajectory of energy use on the Earth, even in, in light of things like renewables, is simply uh, not, not sustainable, is not going to be successful. Um, we have painted ourselves into a corner and we need radical solutions. Those which have been put forward and are currently being um, supported by governments and industry are insufficient. 